Thank you, Stan. Welcome. The second lecture of Dr. David Baker. Um, he's a professor of biochemistry at the University of Washington and investigator of the uh, Our Use Medical Institute. Yesterday he presented a protein prediction problem, and today he's talking about protein design, which is a very important application. To, uh, what it can teach us about uh, more about proteins, and also we can think of the thing that you can do uh, with protein design. Uh, one of the things we're going to learn about is how to design enzymes. It's an extremely difficult task because with the proportion of the disease in uh, protein design that's enough, the complexity that is required for optimizing a transition state. And so we'll learn our strategy that includes calculation combined information search can be successful. I want to invite this
usually the E. coli expression vectors, pet vectors with um, uh, uh, his tags on them. And so you put them in E. coli, you, you make an, uh, you break the cells, you run them over a nipple column, and you have your protein. And then you assay, and um, and then uh, you find out how good your design was. And I wasn't really sure where to include this, but this we just got a few days ago. Um, and you can see that. The, I would say the opinion is not unanimous about whether protein design is a worthwhile endeavor. Um, so, uh, um, so here's how the uh, how the calculation uh, works. One starts with um, a, a protein backbone in this case, and now instead of now we need to search through all possible sequences for a sequence which is very low in energy when it's on this protein backbone. This is for the problem of designing a new structure. Um, and basically, all, what's happening is that each step, we're going through and um, putting in a new confirmation of a new amino acid or an alternative confirmation of an alternative amino acid. And uh, we can do this very rapidly. Again, this movie, this, this the actual calculation doesn't take much longer than what you're seeing here. Uh, and so uh, we can very quickly come up with amino acid sequences that um, pack very well in in any arbitrary structure. You can see here the, the blue things are nonpolar, so we end up with a completely nonpolar uh, solution. Now, in practice, when we want to make a new protein with a new fold, um, we can't just draw a backbone on, on, on the back of an envelope and then use this method to, uh, to find the amino acid sequence which, uh, which packs the core well, because there's no guarantee that there exists any amino acid sequence really fold up to this structure. So because of that, we actually need to um, iterate after we do this first calculation to get the sequence. Then we go into structure prediction mode, kind of like what I described yesterday in that high resolution movie, and we let the backbone jiggle to become optimal for the new sequence. And then we repeat the sequence optimization, and we let this go until we have a sequence and structure combination that really fit well together. Uh, so we used this a number of years ago now uh, to see if we could make a protein with a topology that didn't occur in nature. And uh, the, the, uh, this was before the days of gene synthesis, so we assembled all of those. And um, uh, when the protein was purified, um, it uh, was found to be extremely stable. And uh, we were able to solve the crystal structure. And it was very, very close to um, the structure of uh, that we were trying to make. So we have the computer model, which is shown in blue, and the x-ray structure in red, and they are very, very close to each other. Uh, so this showed that we could make from scratch, uh, from scratch we could design amino acid sequences that fold up to new topologies and could, uh, uh, were very, very stable when they folded up. Uh, now, th there was a big problem, though, and uh, actually before I get there, though, um, so since then what we've done is um, uh, we've been trying to make new folds. And the reason why we're trying to make more very stable scaffolds, the thing about the proteins that we're designing, if you notice them, they, they look much more ideal than most native proteins do. They don't have long loops. The secondary structures are regular. And um, they're, you might think of them as sort of being like a platonic ideal. Of, of this, this, is a, this is a very common protein called fold, called the paradoxic fold. But this, this design protein is very much simpler. So again, we use the same type of protocol. This protein is. Um, very much more stable than uh, naturally occurring proteins. Again, these proteins typically are denaturating in five or six molar quantity, so they're very, very stable. Um, and then um, there's another one, uh, a Rossman fold, again, another very, very common fold. Um, and you can see why we're interested in these, because, of course, Rossman folds use these loops to do things. And um, uh, so um, so we can, we can make. Uh, uh, sequences that fold up to new structures, either new topologies or simpler versions of existing ones. And we can do so uh, with quite high uh, accuracy and they can be very, very stable. But they don't do anything at all. And so um, where we were a few years ago is we knew we could design new protein structures, but um, they weren't very useful unless you wanted a rock because they, um, they really didn't do anything. Okay, so. What we've really been focusing on since then is trying to design proteins which actually do things. And um, the problems I'm going to talk about today are um, designing new um, DNA cutting enzymes and designing new enzymes, um, uh, new enzymes generally. Uh, I thought that I'd make that in my talk. We, we have been working on designing um, HIV vaccines, and they're, uh, they're the uh, the idea is to take um, epitopes from GP120, which are uh, recognized by neutralizing antibodies, um, but for some reason our bodies don't make don't um, 
don't frequently make those type of antibodies because the epitopes are probably obscured on the virus. Anyway, he's designed small proteins, sort of like the ones that he showed you, which present the epitopes in a very upfront and center sort of way to hopefully elicit a, a, a response to them. And the hope is that those would then be neutralizing. So this is work done with my colleague, Bill Sheaf in Seattle. Um, and uh, the result so far is we've been able to design proteins which interact quite strongly to be neutralizing antibodies. We have crystal structures, so the epitopes look right. Um, they elicit um, uh, and immune responses that bind to um, these epitopes, even bind to the virus, but they're not neutralizing. So I guess if they were, I would probably only talk about that. Um, so uh, there's, there's, so this is a mystery, I think, uh, part of the big mystery of uh, immunology of um, HIV infection. Uh, okay, so now to talk about um, uh, DNA. I think so what are the types of things you might want to do? Well, long term, um, we're working with a uh, uh, class of endonucleases which recognize very extended uh, recognition sequence, 20 base pairs. And uh, if we could um, uh, redesign these enzymes to cut any arbitrary 20 base pair sequence, then there are a lot of interesting applications. The most obvious one is in gene therapy. So you would go in and design an enzyme that would cleave uh, uh, near the site of a mutation. And then the idea is you would introduce that enzyme along with the wildcat copy, and the double strand break would then hopefully be corrected by, um, uh, by copying off the wildcat template. Uh, there's also possibilities for sort of anti pathogen uh, uh, applications of being able to design very specific entity cases. So in, in this case now, we don't just have a protein, we have a protein here on top of DNA. And it's the same, it's basically the same calculation that I showed in um, that earlier movie where we, where we make the change in the, um, in the DNA. So we put a change the, the, um, the sequence of the DNA here. Then we optimize the protein to recognize that new sequence. And uh, so here's an example. Um, here's a, um, Here's one, this is an extended site. I'm just showing you a blow up part of that site. Here's the wild type uh, amino acids at that position in the, in the nuclease, recognizing the, uh, uh, the wild type base pair. And you can see that if you change this from a GC to a CG, now the wild type amino acids no longer can make good interactions. Um, uh, this, but if you redesign using that movie I just showed, uh, you can get a very nice uh, nonpolar interaction here and a nice hydrogen bonding interaction here. And in fact, um, when you make this protein, it specifically cleaves this sequence, this, this, this CG, whereas the wild type doesn't cleave it. The sort of data one generates is this just shows a number of different designs, but um, this is that new sequence. Uh, the wild type enzyme cuts it at, um, sorry, the, the designed enzyme in green cuts this in um, at low concentration whereas the, um, uh, the wild type enzyme doesn't cut the site. Um, and this, we've gone on and now made um, multiple simultaneous uh, changes. And so I think we can, we're sort of working our way with, with a couple different enzymes towards more general recognition. But I want to tell you about, you know, in the course of doing all this design work, it, sometimes one comes across really um, unusual biochemistry, which I think is, can be very interesting on its own right. And uh, I just wanted to illustrate that here. So this is um, uh, this is a homing endonuclease I, uh, from another enzyme from this family, which they have these two domains, and they recognize this uh, again. They're quite extended sequence, and uh, it had been known for some time that mutations throughout this site, if you make space changes in the uh, throughout this uh, extended site, you knock out cleavage. So this is just a med this is just a cat over cam. The activity of cleavage um, for uh, for all. Um, and what's, what, you're, what you're seeing here is uh, substitutions up to each of the four bases at, um, at each position in the site, so from minus 10 to plus 10. And you can see that throughout the site, um, there are mutations, there are substitutions which pretty much knock out binding. Um, and uh, so there's some down on this side, which is the internal side of the, um, of the, of the uh, complex, and there's, there's others down here. So it's very specific throughout. Um, so we got our first inkling that something funny was going on when we uh, uh, looked at the effect of these mutations on binding. We found that mutations on this side, um, substitutions in this site on this side, affected, had an effect on binding. But the ones down here really didn't seem to um, affect binding much at all. 
So uh, uh, to go on uh, summertime, really fantastic graduate student, decided to um, to carry out uh, 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 the Smith kinetics on, on based on all of these uh, different uh, sites, which was a pretty heroic endeavor. And what she found was um, uh, really quite remarkable. Um, so this shows, for each substitution, the change in KM, the, the substrate, uh, enzyme substrate binding affinity for the Michaelis complex. And uh, again, here's the minus side here. This is the minus side here. You see that all these substitutions are affecting KM on the minus side. And this is a very symmetric interface. You can see that there's pretty much a two-fold axis here. But, be, but in spite of that, um, there's a real asymmetry in how the interactions are, are, are used. So the ones down here seem to be used in binding the substrate, whereas the mutations, the mutations down here, again, have very little effect on KM. But you look at where the effects on KCAP are, substitutions down here, in fact, on this side, actually, in some cases, even make the reaction faster. But mutations down on this side um, almost universally slow the reaction. So there's this really strong partitioning of what the binding energy is being used for. On this side, it's being used to bind the substrate. And here, it's being used to uh, stabilize the transition state. And the, probably the simplest way to think about what will uh, uh, attract a picture is that um, this enzyme needs to scan, scan, scan through a genome and bind its right condition site. It binds in the, in the um, transition state complex, which probably resembles the crystal structure, uh, to this bent uh, confirmation, which is probably uh, not sampled very often uh, in, in a cell. So instead, what it can do is it can bind to B-formed DNA just through this side. It binds in that way. And then uh, the, this interaction, this stabilization um, of this bent state um, basically is used to uh, stabilize fluctuations of the DNA that then put it into a confirmation that's heavily confident. But we can now take advantage of this, and we can make specific designs then that either affect KCAT over or KM. So these are just designs that on, on design on the minus side, design on the plus side, where we've changed specificity. So this is one that's on the minus side. And again, the color coding is the different colors represent the different bases. So in this design, um, see, so the wild type shown in dotted lines, and the, uh, uh, the, the design is in solid lines. So this design increases the KM, makes it worse for this space, this space, this space, but makes it better, uh, drops the cam for this one. So it achieves, this design is changing the specificity of wild type by, um, by modeling the KM for the different um, bases, but it has um, pretty much no effect on the K cap for these different uh, substitutions. On the other hand, we have this design on the plus side, which is not having much effect on the KMs for the different um, possibilities of that position, but it's um, it's drastically reducing the KCAPs for, um, you see, for the wild type, pretty much has uniform. The KCAPs are very similar, but uh, in this design, they're lowered for three of the four base pairs, leaving only the blue one highly active. Uh, so, um, so this shows that we can now sort of go one level beyond sort of this great design, uh, sort of design specificity. We can actually go in and now uh, modulate the kinetic parameters independently, which you can imagine could be very useful in, uh, depending on what your biological application is. OK, so now um, I'm going to switch gears and talk not about redesigning enzyme specificity, but about uh, de novo enzyme design. And uh, the, so if you can come, come to me and say, design a react an enzyme which catalyzes this chemical reaction, the, uh, uh, the first step is to compute what the uh, intermediates and transition states in that chemical reaction are. Uh, then the next step, and this is sort of the, the fun part, is to design um, a disembodied active site around this, say, the transition state for the reaction. So you might say, well, I have a hydrogen bonding group here, a positive charge here, a negative charge here. But these are completely disembodied. And as Alessandro uh, mentioned, we can use uh, quantum mechanics calculations in collaboration with and house group to sort of determine the optimal positions of these. Um, you can also use chemical intuition about where um, uh, where would be optimal, how to be best uh, promote the electron flow in a bond breaking or bond making reaction. Um, this is really just a hypothesis. This is like what you see in a biochemistry textbook. 
you know, they first show you the structure of trips and the whole thing, and then it zooms in on the active site, and you just see the catalytic triad and the transition state. We start that. We start with just that low enough view. Well, we don't know what an ideal active site would necessarily look like. We just have hypotheses. Um, and so, in general, for a new reaction, we need to have a number of different hypotheses because we don't know which one is actually going to be able to uh, catalyze the reaction. So once we have this ideal active site, uh, we design a protein that um, that contains this ideal active site. So we, we have this ideal active site we want to make, and now we, we have to build a scaffold which um, has that ideal active site. And that's why we went back after top seven to start kind of making new folds. These are basically two ways to build the scaffold. One is you could construct a novo, a scaffold that is just perfectly, uh, where all the backbone is just perfectly poised to hold the catalytic residues. And the other thing you could do is just go through naturally occurring scaffolds. Um, and so for most of what I'm going to be telling you now, we're going through a naturally occurring uh, scaffolds of thermophilic proteins that are very, very stable. So where we take, uh, remove large numbers of side chains, put in the ones that, uh, put in the ones that create the site. But this isn't really ideal because these, uh, these proteins really evolve to do something else. So we'd like to be able to do it from scratch. Uh, so given the description of an ideal active site, though, then we need the next step is um, to, uh, uh, well, let me illustrate this first part. We need to find, we need to figure out what scaffolds we can use to actually hold that ideal active site. So here's a really simple example. This is called the hemp elimination reaction, where we're going to extract this proton and um, uh, uh, then it's going to ultimately lead to breakage of this bond here. So this is the product. Um, so the first thing we need to do, like I said, is, is choose a catalytic motif. This is like a disembodied active site. So here's an example. Here we have a negatively charged group that's pulling off the proton that's forming this base here. And we have a positively charged group that's stabilizing the negative charge that's appearing here. And here's another scheme where we have a histine that's pulling off the proton and a carboxylate group that's backing up and holding the histine in place. We have a hydrogen bond in this case that would stabilize the negative charge. So you can see there are a lot of different options even for a very simple reaction like this. So the next thing we do is we take this large set of scaffolds uh, and we ask where can we geometrically, where, where can we geometrically reconstitute this site? So the backbone, we need some backbone here, here, and here. And and we need to have room for the substrate. So we felt uh, geometric hashing algorithms for that. After we found these places where you can support these residues, the next step is to design all the surrounding amino acids. Um, that's shown here. It's a little hard to see. And the final step is to select the best designs and uh, make them. And um, this is uh, now an illustration of the two designs, designs using two of the motifs, the two motifs I have on the preceding slide. So if you remember, uh, there was the one with the carboxylate pulling off the proton, that's here. And there was the one, then we had, um, uh, let's see, you can't see the lysine, I think, coming in in this case. Uh, you see the substrate, which is in yellow, is sitting in a nice hydrophobic pocket that's been designed. That's part of the second step of the optimization. And we have an aromatic residue on top that's sort of planting the substrate in place. Now, the other option to call was having a histine, which is now pulling off the proton here. And this is backed up by a carboxylate group. And again, we have a hydrophobic pocket, in this case, an aromatic group that's planting it in. Um, so the um, neat thing is that uh, these, uh, these designs, they're very simple, but they, uh, they do have enzymatic activity. This is just the amount of product form versus time. And uh, when, you, um, when you mutate the residues, which are, like this is the glutamate, this is the one that was on the When you make the glutamate, glutamate into a glutamine, you completely lose activity. And this is for the one that used the histine and the spartate. If you remove the histine, uh, you are down to here. And if you remove the um, spartate, you're down to here. So it's not as absolute a requirement. Um, so that's a very simple reaction. Um, I'll just take you through um, a couple other reactions uh, and then I'll make some more general comments about where we are with this. Um, and uh, so here's a, here's another reaction, and this one is is interesting because it's not catalyzed by uh, naturally occurring enzymes, or at least there are no well documented cases of enzymes that catalyze this reaction. It's called the Niels Alder reaction. So here we have uh, this group in blue, this group in green, and they're going to come together to form this ring here. So we're forming two carbon carbon bonds. In order to catalyze this reaction, one has to bring these two groups next to each other. And um, that's shown here. 
and also uh, it needs to perturb the um, orbital energies of, of the uh, uh, of this guy and this guy so that they overlap more to increase the um, the rate of reaction. And we do that by introducing hydrogen bonding groups, which um, an electron donating group which will raise the energy levels on this side, and an electron withdrawing group here, which will um, uh, uh, lower the um, uh, the lumo energy here to increase the overlap again. Um, and uh, this is basically the same thing I showed before. So this just shows an example of such a design. Uh, here we have the small substrate and the big substrate. We have the hydrogen bonding, the hydrogen bonding group here and the hydrogen bonding group here. Those are what are doing the orbital perturbations. And um, again, this is the case where we, we go through and make the gene. And um, uh, the, um, this shows a body versus time here. Notice that this is not a very good um, uh, enzyme. If this were a net, well, there aren't actually occurring enzymes to catalyze this reaction, but if there were, this would probably be seconds, not hours. Um, but that's, uh, that's just where things are at that now, right now. Um, so we, um, we have a crystal structure of this design, as we did, uh, we do also the, the, the preceding ones. Um, and in general, the crystal structures are quite close to, um, uh, to what we, um, to the bowl we've been trying to make. Now the interesting thing with, about this reaction is that these substrates can come together in several different ways. And uh, so this is the, um, the <coughs> substrate, this is the other. And so there are various, there are various um, antimers that can be produced. And uh, you can separate these as shown here. And what's neat is we only form one of them. And it's the one that we were actually trying to make, this one here. So there's some specificity here. Um, so, all right, so to summarize where we are so far then, I showed you uh, an example of uh, an enzyme that uses general acid base catalysis, pulling off the proton and putting 41 on on the other side, the chemical elimination. I showed you a bimolecular reaction, the deals all the reaction. Um, and I talked a little bit about uh, the aldol uh, reaction, which involves covalent catalysis, where the enzyme becomes covalently bound to the uh, protein. Um, and uh, I'm not going to talk about ester hydrolysis uh, today. Uh, so we've been able to use the various, uh, these are pretty much the strategies that native enzymes use to catalyze reactions. But there's a big difference, which is that our cap designs are much less effective catalysts than native enzymes. Now, um, OK, I'll come back to that. But just to show you what the diversity of chemical reactions are, um, here's the camp I showed you. Um, I talked about this one already. Um, here is the reaction I'll talk about in just a moment, uh, forming this carbon-carbon bond or breaking it between these two substrates. There's ester hydrolysis. So these are quite different, and they just show this just shows different types of what, what um, the designs look like. Okay, so now these really aren't very good catalysts, um, but we've been collaborating with um, several groups uh, who are expert at um, a sort of laboratory evolution, including the Antics group here and. Um, the designs I showed you, uh, those pictures of, are called K78 and K59. Um, that also, the numbers are important because it gives you an idea of how many times we had to try. Um, we, don't have, we don't have all the numbers uh, because some of them weren't soluble or some of them we decided not to make. But we're trying quite a few um, designs. Uh, so we're, this is like a one out of ten sort of thing that we get one that works. Uh, so that's an important uh, caveat to what I'm telling you. Uh, but we always keep the numbers on so you can see. Uh, so we start. So we sent these to um, his lab, and his, a student, Olga Konosky, very talented student, uh, took them and started evolving them, just making mutations, screening for ones that have more activity. Uh, even though this is a fairly simple reaction, there isn't anything in any coli extract which catalyzes it. So you can just break open the cells and do the assay. And um, she uh, she's now up to about here. I don't have a revised slide, but the best designs now, the best evolved version of this K59 design. That's the one that uses the, um, the glutamate, uh, um, is now has a K category cam of about five times 10 to the fifth, which is starting to get into the range of naturally occurring enzymes. So the maximum diffusion control will be 10 to the ninth. So, there are, so it's starting to get respectable. And the, K, the, the rate enhancement um, is on the order of 10 to the eighth, a little bit above that. So these are still not as good as naturally occurring enzymes, but they're, they're getting better. Um, of course, we'd like to be able to. Um, uh, compute what these, these are the sequence changes which are spread out throughout the protein. Um, and um, 
it's been possible to get crystal structures of a number of, of these evolved variants. Um, this is actually for the first design we had activity on. I haven't shown you a picture of. Uh, that's the one for which we have the most structures now. It's called K7. And we were really, really silly when we made the design. It had a, a glutamate that was extracted the proton. And this lysine, if you remember, was supposed to stabilize the negative charge. But if you put a, if you put a positive next to a negative, then um, they can decide to do other things. And that's what you see in this crystal structure here. Now, once we saw this crystal structure, of course, we got rid of the lysine. And that, um, uh, that uh, increased the activity considerably. But um, evolution solved problems in unusual ways sometimes. So during the directed evolution, what happened is uh, a negative chart, negative cluster sort of evolved down here, which distracted the lysine down and uh, got it out of the way. And what you see happening by the final round of evolution is that this catalytic residue really held quite a bit in place, really better position to pull off that proton. Uh, so uh, this is, um, there's, this is a, um, the reaction I mentioned before. This is the retroaldol reaction, where we're breaking, in this, in this direction, we're breaking this carbon-carbon bond here. And this uh, reaction is a little bit different from the others. You know, as I said, we're forming a covalent uh, bond between the protein and the substrate, and that's shown here. Um, this is a complicated reaction. These are many, many steps. You form this enzyme substrate intermediate, then you break the bond here, and then you need to recycle uh, the, um, uh, the free enzyme. What we've been able to do here, well, actually, you can see. Um, so we had to try, and we, as I said, we always have to try multiple mechanisms. And we tried a, a number of things. And the one that worked really well was one which where we used an, a water molecule that was positioned by two hydrogen bonding groups that we designed in. And this water molecule helps facilitate proton transfer between these two oxygens. This is the bond that's going to get cleaved right here. Uh, so what's been exciting recently about this is um, a couple of things. Uh, uh, first of all, we've been able to, using this motif, we've been able to design um, this active sites and catalyze this enzyme which, uh, catalyze this reaction very reproducibly. So we're not at one out of 10 anymore. We're pretty much we're better than one out of two. So we a very high frequency of the designs, the new designs that we make for this reaction um, actually work. And this just shows the range of protein scaffolds and the ranges of positions of, catalyt of the catalytic lysine that where we have now active designs. So this, we like this one because we actually understand um, how to reproducibly produce designs that catalyze this reaction. Um, and they, they're quite pretty. This is what a design model looks like. Here's the two, um, the two residues which are coordinating the water. Here's the lysine that's coming in and, uh, and forming a covalent interaction with the substrate. And here's the binding pocket for the substrate here. So what's neat is we just have gotten a, a crystal structure of this, and I think I'll just skip to here. So in the crystal structure, uh, we, um, uh, let's see, we've been able to track um, intermediates on the lysine. This is the lysine here. By using our oral high priority reduction, we can actually track the, both the substrate and product on the enzyme. And so we get pictures of what these substrate and product complexes look like. Um, one thing that's quite interesting, which I'm not showing you, is that different signed enzymes accumulate different things on the lysine. This one accumulates the, um, the substrate. There are other designs which accumulate the product. Um, so again, there are multiple steps in this uh, reaction, and it's hard to do them all well. It seems like different, different enzymes are, to some extent, blocked with different steps. But what's neat here is these two water molecules, which we had designed in, we actually see in the crystal structure, they're interacting uh, here, and they're positioned by all these hydrogen body groups that we put in. Uh, so this is our, I, we're excited about this, because this is our first co-crystal structure of a designed enzyme with um, a substrate. The substrate lies pretty much in the pocket that we, designed, that we had designed in. OK, so then where are we after all of this? Um, first of all, um, we can design active enzymes from scratch. Um, I've shown you that now. Uh, we've done this now in four different reactions. The starting activities are low, um, but they can be increased uh, by directed evolution. Um, there are uh, clearly some things that are happening that are wrong. There are competing reactions. The product of the reaction goes back on and slows down the activity. Um, it's clear that uh, uh, we need more precise positioning of the catalytic groups. Our level of control is not so high. And I think one of the bottom lines is that 
real enzymes are masters of the art of compromise. They have to bind substrate, they have to carry out the chemistry, they have to release product, and if there are multiple steps, they can't get hung up at any of them. And uh, uh, reproducing this is really not very easy. And so from a practical point of view, one of the key questions is not really about protein design, but it's about evolution. We can make things, we can make things that catalyze uh, these chemical reactions. We can make them from scratch, but they're again not very active catalysts. And we can also make quite a few of them. For the alkylase, for some retroalcohol, we can make you know many tens, and um, probably like 40 or 50 by now. Um, but none of them are very active. Uh, so the real question is, I think we, we could turn back the clock three million years and look at the ancestors of modern day enzymes. Um, how active were they, and how many different starting points did evolution need to be able to get one that was really, really good? These naturally occurring enzymes are just orders of magnitude better than these. So it's not clear whether, like, could we take any one of these designs and, and do we not, and by evolving it, um, doing enough rounds of direct evolution, get it to the level of naturally occurring enzymes? Or are there many, or a large fraction of them with dead ends? Or they, so, sort of question about dead ends in evolution. And this is the practical question. Um, I don't think it's likely that in the short term we'll be able to design from scratch uh, catalysts that are very, very highly active. So I think from a practical point of view for making uh, new, new um, enzymes, one will be left with sort of making things that have starting activity and then optimizing them experimentally. Uh, I should say one of the areas that uh, we're very interested in here uh, is uh, uh, there are a lot of interesting applications, um, obviously, in the energy area because it's, for example, it's, um, you can capture uh, uh, energy using on silicon solar panels very effectively, but using that energy to make molecules, no one's really figured out a way to do that. But if you could design enzymes or a little pathway that could take um, electrons um, off an electrode of a, uh, of a solar panel um, or from electricity, uh, from a, take a voltage difference that generate what using solar power uh, at an electrode, use it to reduce some compound and then get electrons from there into a cell, uh, through some sort of design pathway, it'd be very interesting. So there are a lot of interesting applications of enzyme design, but we kind of need to know the answer to this to know, um, you know, how many how many starting points do we need to have, and so forth. So that's one of the real key questions. Um, so just to sort of summarize what I told you in these two uh, talks, then. Um, so what I told you yesterday is that for the structure calculation problem, it was really the problem was really a search problem that find the lowest energy state for a protein is 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 um, is a very, very difficult protein for anything but the smallest uh, protein structure. We didn't really have a problem with accuracy, though, because once we got close enough to the native structure, we really fell into this deep hole. And uh, because of that, the, solu the solution I was advocating was to get um, experimental data, which would sort of indicate what the position of the, of the native structure was, and then do computation to work out all the details. That's, for example, what we were doing in the structure in the cases with NMR data. We would use the NMR data to guide the low resolution search, and then we would, um, uh, but we wouldn't use the data to determine the fine details of the structure because there was a deep, evolved energy gap. Um, because evolution had really optimized that sequence to be very low in energy in that in the native structure. Now, in the case of designing function, it's really quite different. We don't have a search problem. We can come up with these motifs, and then we have these algorithms for rapidly um, uh, finding places where we can design proteins, new backbones, and have these. The problem is our accuracy isn't very high because unfortunately we're no longer dealing with design the parts of evolution. Instead, we're dealing with things that we've designed, we've come up with, and uh, uh, so they aren't really as optimized for the structure we want to have. And so this is why we don't have the precise control. We can't get the high accuracy necessarily that we have for um, uh, in the structure prediction case. Um, and we also don't we have, we're far from having a complete understanding of the requirements for catalysis. And I think by designing new enzymes, or trying to design new enzymes, we're, we're learning a lot about what really is important. Um, because of all this incomplete understanding, um, we, we, can, we can do the computation first because we can, again, we don't have a search problem, we can just build any site we want in principle. But we need an experiment to tell us how good of our, our designs are and then to optimize them. And uh, we need a lot of experimental feedback to, uh, to tell us how to um, both improve our current designs and learn in general how to make better enzymes. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit, I uh, want to show you a little bit more about full bit just to be in harmony with yesterday, but let me first acknowledge uh, uh, the people who've done this work. So the uh, design of the new scaffold <laughs> scaffolds I showed is the work of two very talented Japanese postdocs, postdocs, Nobula, Green, and Foga. Uh, the end of nucleus redesign is the work of, we talked about the work of the summer time. Uh, uh, and to know when I design, uh, Justin and Alice did the work on the Niels Alvarez. Um, Eric and Ling have done the work on the um, on the retro lace, and Daniela did the work on the Kemp. And uh, this has been a collaboration with Danny Topic, Olga Kronsky, and uh, Don, Don Hilbert. Um, 
So let's see. Okay. Well, now um, <coughs> the uh, so now what I want to show you is that we now have Foldex set up to not not just uh, predict structures, but to actually do um, design. And so what I, what I, the puzzle that's up now, I'm sort of limited by what you can get on the web, is rather than uh, designing new enzyme, this is designing a protein which binds biotin. This is a very, this is a, um, a sort of a model problem we're working on. So here's biotin here. We give people a starting structure where we use the same sort of matching algorithms to basically um, build an uh, ideal active site sort of copying from streptavidin, uh, uh, hydrogen bonding groups to bind the base of the biotin. And uh, the, uh, you can sort of see that here. But then what people can do, in addition to all the things I showed you yesterday, uh, they can go in and um, they can try and make it better. And I'll show you how that works. Like to get a substrate, 
up against the catalytic residue will generally be unfavorable. So you really need to exert force and a very precise positioning to do that. Um, and so that may be missing. Probably both are missing. We don't have precision where we need it. We don't have uh, dynamics where we need it. And I think, but I think I'm pretty excited. I think we'll learn from um, by continuing to follow up uh, and improve these times. What about the lines that if you do the assays in the function of temperature, do they have thermophilic like profiles? Um, they, they have pretty much, they have thermophilic like profiles initially, but after you evolve them, they have more mesophilic ones, which is sort of what you'd expect. I mean, that's the, you know, the, um, uh, so, yeah. The, yeah. So, in the uh, mean solder reaction that we were designing, have you ever thought of like putting a, a mean move? Because the mean solder transition state is really high energy and has got kind of an aromatic character. And so, you know, it can stabilize that by you know, putting in a uh, kind of high. Yeah, kind of yeah. high. Well, that's an interesting idea. We, we haven't tried that. We've used primarily aromatic groups for stacking. But that's an example of the. Of where this is at, there are a lot of different ways about going about trying to solve these problems, and uh, you know it could be in some cases we just miss on the optimal uh, idealized site configuration. But we have to try that. Yeah. So uh, when you do your computational designs, presumably you come up with a number of different configurations for the you know, and like the yeah. 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 And you see the Yeah, so of course what we're doing is we're now going back to the complications and saying, well, why didn't we come up with these substitutions in the first place? In fact, Rob Moretti, who's a graduate student here, is uh, in my lab about a month ago as a postdoc, and he's, he's really focusing on that question. Uh, there are, let's see, uh, we, I can't think, can't think of a specific case where we know we, uh, we threw out something, but it almost must be happening because when we do the computational design, it's going through you know, all possible sequences and it, if there's something that we find out after the fact that's clearly better, then uh, then it was clearly must have been missed. A lot of it is because you know the, the, there's a lot of you know, the ligand moves a little bit, and now you can accommodate, for example, a bigger residue. So we sample alternative ligand conformations, but we can't do that infinitely find them. So that's an example where we might miss something for a trivial reason. Yeah. Do you do you know about design the loops to make your rocks a little more flexible? Yeah, that's right. So we are. That's one of the things we're really focusing on now. To go to these and trying to design the loops, both to, yeah, to get more flexibility, maybe to allow the substrate in more uh, more readily. Yeah, exactly. So we're we're trying that now. Yeah. Just today you mentioned you leave the formation state of the side chains in their natural state. Yeah. So here you have to. Here you clearly can't do that, right? So like for the glutamate and the, the camp, that really the model of the protein state. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, we can also determine it experimentally by looking at the pH dependence of the reaction. And um, actually, we can, we can't fix it. The shifts are pretty much where you'd expect them to be. So the pKs, it seems like getting a pK shift is not such a big deal. You could, so for example, if you have a very lysine, that pK drops. So I thought that was a bit harder problem than it turned out to be. We're more limited by other features, it seems. So you're able to predict? Um, I would say that in general the designs, when we go and look at the pKs of the residues, they're in the range you'd like. So the glycines tend to have a pK around six and a half or seven, the glutamates around six. So that so I'm just saying that it, it, that we're we obviously we are able to re predict reasonably well what the pKs are going to be. We're not doing anything terribly sophisticated, you're just by hurrying them you get them you're shifting them. Yeah. What is the number of the acid What's the number? Yeah. Well, let's see. There are not, I think the, the smallest one is about 150 amino acids. And what do you think? How much is going to be cut down? I don't think it can be cut down much because you need to have a pocket, uh, uh, at least for, you know, if you look at how enzymes find substrates, if the substrate's small, generally you need to have, you know, something that will envelop it. For a bigger substrate, it can kind of lie on the surface, you know, like generosity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Would be. Yeah. In terms of designing the uh, more greater flexibility, it seems that there are retro alkylase reaction to yeah. incorporate two water molecules. Yeah. Does that allow greater flexibility yeah. in the chemistry? I think that's so absolutely that's some kind of control <coughs> slump that you're I think it's 
absolutely right. Yeah. So I think that the, well, the water is letting you get away with with primes that you couldn't get away with if you were using the ends of side chains because they can move around, they can easily rotate. I think that's exactly right. Are there opportunities to put in more waters? Well, actually, what we're trying to do now is replace those with uh, with with charge groups because we think that that, that may be why we have um, why we're not getting more than a certain amount. I think it's good for starters, but in actually occurring evolution, I'll bet that early on there's a lot more use of water, and then you gradually replace water with things that you can. Water's good, bad for the same reason it's good. And have you thought of now designing concrete for these homes? Yeah, so we are trying now um, to make design bridges that will be totally soluble and organic solvent. Um, and uh, so we're trying to basically take uh, the top seven that, that we've pulled away. Well, we've now got a version that has a largely full of uh, a big. Uh, fuller network in the core, and we're trying to figure out how we can make the protein so we can get it into our, see whether it's actually soluble and get it solved. And finally, uh, enzymes and membranes? Uh, no, we haven't gotten there yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what about enzymes that can do successive operations? So, attaching domains, sort of like the polyketide synthesis? Yeah, well, that would um, I think that's again for the future. I think we need to understand how to do these simple things first. The retroalol reaction. It, there are multiple steps. They're all just one reaction pathway, and we can see even for that simple thing, we're getting stuck in different steps. So um, we have to be a lot better than we are uh, before we can get there. Yeah. And didn't you, can you, in a rational way, design allosteric switches, something that you could control with light or ligand or something of like that? Yeah, well, we're trying to do that now, actually, because um, uh, fortuitously, it turns out there's a phosphate binding site in the scaffold for that one that can thing. So we're now trying to see if we can put in larger groups of phosphate. Anchors, you know, and, and see if we can modulate the activity that way. And then we can go and design uh, So I think that should be possible. So finally, on the DNA interface aspect of things, how frequently do you find a base by base recognition pattern versus multiple bases and um, affiliated changes and coordinated yeah. changes of the site? That's right. So we've now found we have some cases now we've been able to. We make redesigns for four consecutive base pairs, and they clearly are much more, more than the individual sums of the individual residue substitutions. So you need to consider them all sort of at the same time. Do you see side chains move in a coordinated way? Is what I'm yeah, I think, that's, I think it's exactly what happens, that you change one and therefore you can change another. So we do we see exactly that type of thing going on when we do the design. <laughs>